Hi everyone, this is Karen. Uh, we'll just wait a couple of moments here just to get started. Uh, hopefully people can hear me. Okay, at 7.01, we're going to get started. Uh, this webinar this evening is on swim efficiency and mechanics. Uh, as you all know, you are muted, so I can't hear you. However, if you do have questions during the presentation this evening, please feel free to uh, type in a question, and I'll be looking for those questions throughout the presentation. And so if um, I will address the question during the presentation or at the end of the presentation, if uh, they're not necessarily relevant to the uh, information that we're sharing at this point in time. Okay, so we are going to get started. Um, <clears throat> for those of you that don't know me, my name is Karen Allen Turner and I'm a, a QT2 and outrival racing triathlon coach. I'm also a level two USA triathlon coach and past uh, USA team coach in 2016 and 18. As I mentioned tonight, we're talking about swim mechanics and efficiency. And I, I'm imagining that for most of you that are on this call this evening, the reason that you're on this call is because uh, you are looking to improve your swim. For many of us, myself included, that don't come from a swim background, probably find the swim to be very uh, frustrating at times because our tendency as triathletes is that if we do more work, we'll do better. And with the swim, this isn't necessarily the case. Um, swim, I always equate swim to a golf game. Uh, it's very technical and can be very frustrating. The progress can be very slow. But through consistency and working on some of the mechanics, you can really help your efficiency with the swim. So now that we're in the middle of the season for most of us uh, and we will be approaching off season, it's definitely a timely uh, webinar because it's something that you'll be able to think about going into the off season and how you're going to work on improving the swim. And whilst you can't necessarily win a race with the swim. You've probably all heard the saying that you can lose a race with a bad swim. So um, my goal here tonight is to help you think about your swim, put on your analytical hat, because swimming being very technical requires a lot of analysis. Put on that hat tonight and start thinking either about your own swim mechanics or also those of maybe athletes that you're coaching. Uh, so we let me just Go on to the next slide here. So for those of you who've listened to any of our QT2 presentations in the past, you'll understand that we have what we call our five cornerstones to performance. Um, and those five cornerstones consist of training and nutrition, which are really part of the preparation that determine, um, that are part of the preparation that will help determine race outcomes. And then we also have race fueling and pacing, which are the execution components and together the preparation and execution will affect the race outcome. You'll see in here we've also added in mental fitness because training alone and looking at the first four points alone without addressing mental fitness uh, will definitely um, affect your race outcome. So tonight we're gonna to mainly talk about the aspects of training and mental fitness. Uh, we're, not, we're not gonna really go into race fueling and pacing in this presentation tonight. So what we often see with, with our athletes is that they come to us with maybe a great run and a great bike and an average swim. Um, with swim itself, we, we do see a continuum of swim times. So even though the swim is the shortest component of a triathlon, we, we do see such a large continuum of swim times. So at the front of the pack, you have your, maybe your seasoned swimmers that have come from a swim background. And then we see the continuum right, uh, right through. So very broad range of swim times in such a short space of time. Uh, usually most athletes are training somewhere between three and four days a week. Often that may consist of a master's swim program as well as maybe a day of open water and maybe a, a swim day on their own following a prescribed program. Um, and I think probably another common theme we see is on the mental side where we had athletes saying, is it worth putting the work in? Uh, what's the return on investment? 
So instead, what they do is they focus on, like I said, going harder and having longer sessions. So we're going to address this tonight, but because we're going to talk about um, the aspect the the that we're looking at here is talking about speed and affinity. Every athlete wants to be faster. So in order to be faster, we're really looking at two areas here. We're looking at the training component and we're looking at the technique component of the swim. If we look at training, we're looking at the three principles of training. So we're looking at intensity, duration, and frequency. And we'll talk a little bit more about the training aspect a little later. But for now, we're going to focus on the technique side. And of the technique side, I really bring that into two areas that we're going to focus on, and that's drag and propulsion, because it's drag and propulsion that really make up the technique. So before we get into some of the discussion on, you know, how can we work on improving technique and taking a look at some, you know, common themes we see with technique issues, I just want to go through the key phases of the freestyle technique. Um, so we have the recovery phase of the stroke, the entry and reach, the catch, the pull and the push, the push being the propulsive phase of the stroke. So let's take a look at each one of these separately. So if we look at the recovery side of the stroke, the recovery is initiated, as you can see in the picture, it's initiated by lifting the elbow upward and forward. So the stroke is actually initiated with the high elbow. The high elbow is preferred because the elbow will help to direct the forearm and the fingers. All right, so sometimes we see athletes that come to us that don't have a high elbow, and have maybe have come from a swim background. And that, that can be fine as long as when they enter the water, their catch is correct. What we often see in people that haven't come from a swim background is that what happens with a low elbow is that it ends up creating um, an opposite effect. So if the elbow is low, the, the athlete will tend to come across their midline in their stroke. So that's why in the pool, we talk a lot about getting the high elbow because that will help to initiate that lead, that lead with the forearm and therefore correct entry, which can then translate into a correct pull. When we get to open water swimming, we don't necessarily emphasize it so much because by then we hope that through a lot of technique work in the pool, it's translated to, to the open water swim. And the, in open water, sometimes your, your actual um, recovery phase of your stroke Will be, will be different because of some of the conditions that you face with in open water swimming. And we'll talk more about that shortly as well. Uh, the arm is relaxed in the recovery. This is, it's called recovery for a reason. It's where your arm is nice and relaxed and it's kept pretty close to the body. As you can see in the picture here, the hand is lower than the wrist, which is lower than the elbow. So if you can think of almost like a, a little bit of an arc that happens here, and you can see that the front of the hand is aligned with the head. The hand actually passes the head before it enters. Sometimes, uh, some people may have been taught, and especially those of you that may have come from like a total immersion type swimming, um, often they'll have you entering a little closer to your head. Um, I prefer to have an athlete's hands enter about at least 12 inches or more past their head to the entry. Otherwise, um, sometimes if you enter too close to the head, the trajectory of the hand means that the, the stroke ends up going deep into the water, too deep into the water, rather than being stretched out. So some of the, the common flaws that we see is that low lateral recovery that I talked about. So not getting that high elbow, which means if we were to follow that trajectory with the low elbow, means that the arm tends to swing across midline and that's where you will be able to see if you're looking at a swimmer you'll see in the water an op equal and opposite effect so as that arm crosses midline the feet need to counteract that to get balance so th therefore the feet are going to go across midline in the opposite direction um, and you will see that fish-like appearance happen sometimes the other thing we see is rushing the recovery uh, as I said, it is a recovery, so you, it is, you don't need to rush it. And the other thing we see is internal rotation. So what we're talking about here is where the thumb enters the water first. And so that the, the athlete is coming in either thumb first or maybe index finger first into the water. With internal rotation, that can lead to 
um, impingement issues in the shoulder, but also what happens is underwater it, with that internal rotation, the athlete will tend to push water out before pushing the water back. And so with that water being pushed out, that's excess movement that we don't need. So the second phase of the stroke path, the, the recovery phase, is the entry and reach. So the hand, once it's come through the recovery, it's entered directly in line about 12 inches, as I mentioned, in front of the head. And from there, that's when the extension forward happens. So the fingertips will enter first um, with the elbow still above the hand, maintaining that high elbow. And this is where we have this reach. And you would sometimes hear coaches refer to it as uh, a, a glide. Uh, I don't like that term because glide, to me isn't an active word. Uh, we want you to actively be reaching with the palm of the hand facing the bottom of the pool. So the fingers at this point should be nice and loose. It's okay to have a little bit of, of gap between the fingers, almost like you are holding a quarter, um, a quarter between the fingers. It's okay because that means that your hands are relaxed. If your hands are tense, usually that'll translate up the body to tense shoulders and therefore fatigue uh, as you continue to swim. Um, and the entry and, and reach is initiated by a good body roll. Some of the flaws that we see is that hand in that prone position on entry, um, as I mentioned, that some first entry, or the overreaching or entering too early. So entering close to your head or overreaching. So that if you, uh, it's almost like if you reach too far forward before you enter the water, there's nowhere for your hand to go. So you are going to be more streamlined and hydrodynamic if you enter and then reach forward while the hand is underwater. In the catch phase of the stroke, this is where we start the propulsive phase of the stroke. You'll see that we still, if you think about the high elbow that I talked about, the elbow is still above the wrist and the wrist is still above the fingertips. So you have that slight tilt of the hand, almost this little arc or sometimes it's almost like a bit of a rainbow effect so that you can initiate the catch. So that when you initiate the catch, if we were to draw a little pathway here of where those fingertips are going to go from um, that diagram here, the user, uh, the athlete is going to be pushing the water backwards, all right? If the fingertips aren't low, it means that the athlete will generally push water down before they push backwards. Uh, and so, that pushing down on the water, once again, it's a, it's a counter effect. You push down on the water, your body's going to bob up. So sometimes if you look at athletes in the water, you'll see them bobbing in the water. And it's generally because their hands are coming flat down into the water instead of pushing back. Um, so basically, if you think about that hand being directed towards the back wall, and this will help with this early nice, what we call that early catch or early elbow bend. If you can get that elbow, you can see in this um, picture here that the elbow is nice and high, it's still high in the water. And that will enable you to get that catch so that you're pushing backwards. So some of the flaws we do see is that dropped elbow. Once that elbow drops underwater, there's nowhere for the hand to go, but goes down rather than back. Uh, sometimes turning the palm inwards is a, another thing. So instead of directing the water flow straight backwards, you're actually directing the water flow across the body. And then we talk about the pull phase here of, of the stroke. So you'll see here this athlete still has this nice high elbow um, and she's actually pushing the, that water backwards. This is really the power of propulsive phase of the stroke where you're focusing on pressing the water directly behind, keeping that hand nice and close to the body, and the hand accelerates through the phase. And sometimes I like to equate it to when you're riding a bike, um, as you're going through the elliptical phase, as you're cycling, you're going, if you think of it like an oval shape, you're actually accelerating as you go, as your foot goes down from the 12 o'clock position and it comes around to the three o'clock and then from three o'clock to nine o'clock position, so the downward part of the, the um, pedal stroke, you actually accelerate through that. And it's just like the same with swimming. You're accelerating through that phase and then allowing for a nice easy recovery, accelerating through that phase. So some of the, the flaws that we often see here is once again that pushing down on the water because maybe that elbow isn't high up 
and then a lack of body rotation. Um, so with a lack of rotation, the, the slipstream effects will be lost. And then that final phase of the, the stroke that we sometimes forget about is that push. So you can see that she's just pushing in this diagram here. The athlete's just pushing just slightly past, past the hips here. So the hands remaining very close to perpendicular, uh, finishing in a near straight position so that the, uh, uh, the triceps are now engaged. And you'll see that as, as the arm gets to where the thigh is, it starts to unweight itself. And this is how the recovery phase of the stroke then begins. Uh, as you upsweep the hand, so you've taken it past the hips and you've upped it um, to coming out of the water, the hand is going to remain nice and close to the body during this phase. So some of the flaws are things like exiting, not getting this push phase of the, the stroke. So exiting um, the hand too early or sometimes waiting until you're at full extension. So it's almost like the athlete's gone to full extension and the, the arm then windmills through the recovery phase of the stroke. Um, and then pushing water upwards on that exit. So you're actually put, flicking water up. So if you see a flick at the end of the stroke of water, it's because the athlete's actually just going too far in that push phase of the stroke. So you'll see here in these, in these pictures, um, you can see some of the common flaws here of these athletes. So in that first example to the left of the screen, you'll see this athlete where the hand is higher than the elbow. So the athlete is actually um, pushing the water up and you'll see that uh, if we were to draw a line from where the water in her hand is, she's actually stopping, almost like breaking the water with her hand, okay? Um, and in this second picture on the top of the screen, in the middle picture, you'll see here that the athlete is pushing down. As I mentioned to you earlier, this athlete is pushing down primarily because that elbow has, is not remaining high in the water. So there's nowhere, if you think about it while you're sitting here and listening to this presentation and you uh, mimic this the stroke and you're, you've dropped your elbow, then the hand is going to go down towards the bottom of the pool. Um, <clears throat> you'll see in the um, in that picture there just to the to the right here you see once again that that arm is really dropped too low in the water you want to keep that arm that lead arm probably about uh, 10 10 inches or 10 to 12 inches below the water surface okay um, and you can see uh, we've got that nice in the bottom on that bottom uh, left hand side in in the top example we have the user that's breaking the water and in the bottom example, you've got that nice arc happening where the fingertips are lower than the wrist, which are lower than the elbow. Um, in the middle of the screen on the bottom, as opposed to the top there, we have this nice high elbow and you can see that the water is being directed, directed backwards. The other thing that's happening on the right hand side of the screen that, um, that I didn't mention in the first example is that the user is, is not exhaling water. And regardless of whether you're a beginner swimmer or even advanced swimmer, it's not uncommon to see athletes forgetting to exhale water while they're actually, um, while their head's in the water. And you want to really do that because if you keep that water, if you, if you don't exhale, you're going to end up with more buoyancy. And, and you know, if you think about it like a, a balloon, so you want to keep it nice, you want to keep nice and streamlined uh, by exhaling will help to keep you streamlined as well. A few more common flaws here, just to give you some more examples. And I really encourage you, uh, all of you that are sitting in on this call, uh, if you're an athlete, uh, you know, I encourage you when you go to the pool to swim, take a look at some people around you. Um, because often what makes you a better swimmer yourself is by just being, like I said, analytical. Um, I worked with a, a girl for quite a, quite a few years and she wasn't really making gains. Um, for the amount of work she was putting in. And then I asked her to be an assistant coach for me and do some work on deck. And so six months went by and she's like, Karen, I haven't really been swimming much, um, but I just got back in the pool and my times are faster than they ever were before. 
So she'd gone from swimming, you know, four days a week now to swimming once, twice a week, yet her times were faster. And it was simply because she had spent that time on deck as a coach analysing other people's strokes, which made her be more critical of her own stroke. So I really encourage you to take advantage if you have that extra few minutes at the pool to take a look at the swim, um, the swimmers. Some of you may be parents of swimmers as well and you have a, a good opportunity to look at uh, some of the techniques of swim teams. Um, you'll see here in this uh, middle example, obviously this, um, this gentleman here has lost all sense of balance and we're going to talk about uh, that in just a moment about, well, how do we get this balance that we need? And if we look over on the right hand side of the screen, you can see uh, this athlete with the head way, way up high in the water, which is decreasing her efficiency of, of balance in the water, um, as opposed to the swimmer at the bottom of the screen. So we're going to talk specifically about, you know, we've talked about what good technique looks like. Uh, now we're going to talk about the two components of drag and compulsion, uh, propulsion with technique and how we can address those uh, individually. So the thing is that water, water is denser than air as we know and drag in the water increases by the square of the speed that we swim. So therefore as you swim faster the effects of drag are going to become more noticeable. So an athlete going from maybe a two minute per hundred um, may quickly get to a 140 per 100, going from a two minute to a 140 or a, to a 145. You may see quite big gains, but then getting from that 140 or that 135 to 130 is exponentially harder because if the athlete doesn't have good body balance um, in the water, then the effects of drag are going to be more noticeable since they're swimming, um, swimming faster. I like to look at the drag before I look at propulsion because drag. Um, it, it's a, uh, reducing drag requires a skill, whereas propulsion means applying a force. So if you can, because it's a skill, there's really more room for improvement straight off the bat. So we're going to talk about how can you reduce drag. And there's really five areas I like to work on. <clears throat> the first one, most importantly, is you've got to work on balance. All right, we're going to go through some examples of how you can work on <clears throat> and all of these five points. But balance is the most important thing for reducing drag. Without balance, as we saw with that picture of that gentleman in the water, he lacked balance. And so therefore, everything else was off with his stroke. He couldn't get his elbow up high. His, um, his legs were spread apart, um, simply because he didn't have any balance in the water. The second thing is you want to swim tall. So regardless of your height, you want to swim as tall as you can to be as fish-like as you can in the water. The other third, third thing is to keep the head nice and neutral. So in the one example we looked at in the previous picture, we had the girl with her head up nice, nice and high. All right, that is going to increase her drag. So you want that nice neutral head. You want a compact and efficient kick. Um, some people say, well, you know, I kick really fast or I kick really slow. Is it a problem if I kick slow? And it's not a problem as long as you don't have balance issues. So you only, in triathlon, you only really need to kick as efficiently as much as you can in order to keep your balance. You don't need to overly kick because obviously the more you kick, the more fatigue you're going to be going into the bike and then consequently the run. So by keeping a nice, compact and efficient kick and uh, kicking as little as you can, if you've got good balance, you can get away with that. And then that last point is you need to exhale. So how do we work on applying these principles? So before you can actually apply these principles, the first thing that you really need to look at is you need to look at your flexibility, all right? If I'm asking you to be um, nice and streamlined and tall in the water, yet you don't have that ability to get your arms up over the head like in this picture here, well, then, then you're not going to be able to uh, get that streamlined. So you need to look at your flexibility first. Same with you know, what we sometimes see with athletes, especially runners, is they lack flexibility here in the, um, you know, right here at the front of the foot. So if I'm asking you to, hey, get your, you know, kick efficiently, let's get nice small kicks, but meanwhile your toes are pointing to the bottom of the pool instead of towards the wall of the pool, 
um, because you'd have less of flexibility, well, you're not going to be able to get them streamlined. So the first things to address are your flexibility issues. All right, so how do you do that? So some of the assessment that you would do on dry land would be things like a standing overhead extension, getting into that, um, can you get into a streamlined position? What's your hip flexion um, and trunk rotation ability like? Are you lacking uh, ability to rotate your trunk around its axis? Um, what's your mid-back flexibility? Are you able to retract your scapula, your shoulder flexibility? Um, all of these things, can you do planks? Can you hold a plank? Can you lift your belly off, off the, um, the ground? Are you able to do a reverse kick? So when you're um, laying on a mat, and lifting your legs up, do you have the strength to do reverse kicks? Looking at that ankle flexion and dorsiflexion. So if you don't, if you go through these dry land assessment and you see that there's some limiters here, there's the things that I would be looking to address first and foremost before you start looking at how do we then, um, you know, do the drill. All right. So the next piece of it, once you've addressed your maybe limiters on dry land, is to look at the drill. So the thing is you want to work on one aspect of your stroke at a time. Um, that's the beauty of doing drills. It allows you to work on one aspect of your drill, at, um, of your stroke at a time. It also breaks the stroke down into a sequence approach. Some people have the ability to have multiple pieces to a puzzle and then put it all together. Some people can only work on one piece at a time in a sequential approach. So until they've mastered A, they can't move on to B and can't move on to C. So what drills does, it allows you to work to, depending on the type of person you are, whether you need to work in a sequential approach or um, a more ad hoc approach, getting all the pieces and then being able to put it together. The other thing with drills, it allows for those neurological adaptations um, and it encourages repetition. So some of the drills that I would be looking at if you're going to look at those five things we talked about, such as you know your balance, keeping nice and tall, efficient, efficient kick, all right, so keeping that head nice and neutral, kicking on the back, excellent drill. Uh, I always tell my athletes I like to have their fins kind of like these uh, recreational fins, not the short fins, because the short fins are great for strength and propulsion work, but for doing drills and for balance work, having these longer fins, um, are definitely more effective. The other thing that the along the fins allow you to do is allows you to get some flexibility into your ankles. So I would encourage uh, those, they're about $18 for those um, recreational fins. So just simply kicking on your back. Uh, vertical kicking, another good one, a great way to strengthen that kick. You can change up your tempo of that kick. You can go from doing nice big kicks to small little flutter kicks. All right, and then once once you do that drill, so you might do some vertical kicking and then from the vertical kicking, go into kicking off the wall and putting that vertical into how does that relate to freestyle. So whenever you're doing any of these drills, I really encourage you to, to ask yourself that question, why am I doing the drill and how do I now, how does it apply to freestyle and how can I um, take this drill component and apply it to freestyle. So you should always be thinking that. So when you're at the pool doing your drills, don't use that as your aimless time to wake up uh, in the morning. Use it as a very, as your, that's the time that you should be thinking. When you get to your set work, you shouldn't be thinking quite as much. You should be using the clock, but you shouldn't really be, be over analytical. This is the time to be analytical and to really take these drills slowly because it's always easier to, to muscle your way through a drill than it is to do it slowly. If you can do a drill really slowly and you can do it well, it means that you have mastered that component. What, when you have to bully your way through a drill, it means that you haven't quite maybe mastered your balance or um, uh, you know, one of your other components. Um, kicking on the back, now adding rotation into it. So rotating about the axis. And you know, all of these drills can be incorporated. It doesn't have to be just a whole session of drills, but you can do, you know, 25 yard of a drill freestyle, 25 drill, 25 freestyle. You can incorporate drills as part of your recovery between sets. You can incorporate drills at the end as part of your cool down. 
And I do like, you know, I do like to do some drills at the end as a part of a cool down just to, um, to basically help you to remember what it feels like to, to be efficient in the water. Um, things like underwater pushing off the wall, getting into that nice streamlined position. Practice doing that underwater pushing off the wall in different positions where your hands aren't streamlined, they're by your side. Um, try that. Try it where your head is a little bit elevated and you'll be able to see the effects of drag come into play by just simply, uh, you know, going through this exercise. Um, kicking on your stomach with your hands outstretched or by your side, keeping that nice, uh, keeping nice and long, nice neutral head. Side balance drills, um, extending the arm by your side, keeping your arms by your side. Doing a shark fin drill. So all the shark fin drill is simply is to raising that arm up the elbow. You can see the elbow in this example is pointed up towards the sky. And that's now going to help set the athlete up uh, for a really good recovery. Torpedo kicking off walls, so pushing off the wall, doing torpedo kicks. So if you're an athlete that really struggles when when your coach says to you, hey, I want you to do a kicking drill and I want you to kick with the board 25 yards, but you actually really struggle with that, I would encourage instead for you to do torpedo kicking off the wall. So you basically go explosive off the wall, kick, 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 until you feel, self, until you feel yourself really slowing down and keep repeating that process. And eventually you'll find that you'll be able to kick for a little bit longer. So instead of getting frustrated with the fact that it takes you four minutes to get to the other end of the pool or the fact that you're actually going in reverse, uh, by doing this, it will actually help you to understand that streamline and it'll help you to understand the effects of how a kick comes in, into play. So they're the main components of uh, drag. I'm not sure if anyone has any any questions at this point in time. If you have a question, feel free to uh, send it to me and I'll address it. Otherwise, we'll move on and talk about uh, propulsion. Okay, I don't have any questions at the moment, but uh, feel free at any point. I'm gonna talk a little bit about propulsion now. The other aspect of technique. And so, uh, basically, propulsion is improved first and foremost by working on those stroke mechanics. And then once you've worked on your stroke mechanics, the balance in the water, now you can start working on that becoming efficient in applying a force to the water. Like I said earlier on, drag is improved by, by simply working on, you know, the efficiency, whereas propulsion, you become efficient as you are able to apply force through a water. So what are the principles that we mainly talk about for increasing propulsion. Uh, we look at the high elbow because once again, that high elbow will help set you up for the good entry into the water and therefore um, culminate in a good catch um, and pull through the water. Engaging the core. Um, so by engaging the core, now you're using, you know, the core is obviously um, key to helping you with your hip rotation and drive in the water. Uh, kick. Uh, even, at, you know, when we look at the kick used to increase propulsion, we're talking about, you know, if we look at elite athletes, they might 10% of their speed may come from the kick. So the rest of athletes that aren't elite athletes but are efficient athletes, their kick may equate to 7 or 8%. For those that aren't uh, very efficient in the water, their kick may be 1%. So as far as you as an athlete need need to address where you feel is your limiter and for some of you it may be simply the kick you're at that point where it's the kick that is that limiter um, and then cadence and we'll talk a little bit more about cadence in a moment <clears throat> so how do you work on this hip rotation and drive so the hip rotation and drive basically what that is it's, it's having the body work as one unit and sometimes I'll say to athletes well could do you know what your legs were doing while your arms were working and they and their body is totally disconnected in half. What you want to get that feeling of is that as the kick happens with, for example, what's, what's happening on the right leg, what's happening with the opposite arm um, um, as that kick is happening, and getting them to happen in uh, a sequence. So as that kick goes down, the, and the right kick goes down, the left arm is, is entering and reaching in the water. 
And that's a really hard concept to get, to get that, that connection between hands and feet. One of the things that you can do to help that is put like a fin on, say, the right foot and a paddle on the left hand and just try and think of just thinking about that left hand and then going to the other side. But once you can get that connection between foot and hand, that's going to also help you with this um, hip rotation and drive through the water. If you think of the hips almost like being a set of pistons, so as the hips rotate in the water from left to right, the faster those hips rotate, it's like a piston, you're going to actually drive yourself through the water a lot faster. So um, some things you can do is doing 25 yard repeats, focusing on the core being engaged. So almost feel that belly button push up towards your spine and feel, once you think of that belly button going towards your spine, that will engage the core. Um, Using a pull buoy can help you to really focus on engaging the, the core and help with this hip rotation and drive. Things like um, counting strokes, you know, odd lengths, um, you might count the amount of hand entries and even lengths, you might count your hip rotations. Um, so you also might use focusing on hand extension. So um, on odd lengths in the pool, you might nudge your, um, uh, your, your hip lightly, you might nudge that hand to your hip lightly. And, and on even lens, uh, lengths, you add a little bit more energy to that hip drive. So you can really be conscious of that hip doing the work. Uh, varying the tempo. So really rotating the hips at, at deliberate tempo. And this is where you could use a tempo trainer so that you can maybe set your tempo a little bit higher than you normally do, but really focus on those hips. So um, another visualization you might have is thinking of, for example, that left hip pushing down towards the bottom of the pool, driving down towards the bottom of the pool and and so on okay the other thing is to listen as you increase your energy and the tempo are you is there more uh, splash noise and bubbles so things for you to think about you can see here in these examples um, um, you know this kicking from the hips in the in the, the top example you can see that this athlete has their core engaged their rotation is happening at the hips they're kicking from the hips nice straight leg and you'll see um, their toes pointed towards the, the back of the pool. Whereas in the, uh, in the bottom example, you'll see how we have this bend happening. So there's a disconnect happening between the um, top half of the body and the lower half of the body, resulting in this, this bend happening. You'll also see in that bottom picture where the arm is actually pointed down, um, so, so you know, have totally straight elbows. So we've lost a lot of uh, propulsion there. Um, one thing that I did mention earlier is that I was going to address cadence. So at Q22 and Outrival, we have this chart that we like to use, and uh, it's available on your resources. And it's basically looking at your stroke rate per minute based on your swim pace per 100 and based on your height. So obviously, an athlete that's um, a, short of, a shorter height um, is going to have a higher cadence um, as opposed to maybe a six foot one person. So if we look at how um, this is what we like to see our cadence increase basically as your swim pace per 100 starts to increase. This is where I'd like to use the fitness tempo trainers. You can really, so for example, if you're a five foot seven athlete swimming at a, a 140 pace, you should be looking somewhere the optimal range for you should be around about 65 strokes per minute. You can set your um, tempo trainer onto that um, at that, say, 65 or 63, and you can slowly start to work up. So you might increase it by one beat and work on, so as you do a 50 or a 100, you know, you might start off by just doing 25s at a slightly higher cadence. As that becomes comfortable, you can now do 50s at the higher cadence. Um, you can also do it the other way around where you're doing short 25 and just keep increasing your cadence and finding a sweet spot. So sometimes you might want to, if you're at the pool with someone else, you might want to actually just do 25 repeats and till you identify what your comfortable cadence is. Once you work out what your comfortable cadence is, work out whether it's optimal, whether you can work on increasing it. As far as cadence goes, so sometimes with our athletes that you know are maybe doing our two minutes per hundred, we often see that their cadence is really low. So you want to, you know, we might have a five foot um, four athlete that's, that's swimming two minutes per hundred and they're 
their cadence is in the 50s, all right? So ideally, that athlete wants to start uh, working towards getting a 65 cadence. But like anything, you've got to do it in small bite-sized chunks, just like when you work on cadence on the bike or on the run. Um, so ways that you can now start to work on propulsion, we'll just go through some of these drills here. Um, kicking on the side with rotation. Now we're adding in rotation into the, to the mix here. So now we've got balance and we've got rotation happening um, for the propulsion side of things. Um, doing catch up with a kickboard. So uh, I don't like to necessarily do catch up where you're just doing catch up touching the other hand because that sometimes encourages people to cross midline. So if you are going to do catch up, I encourage you to do it uh, with a kickboard so that you are touching each side of the kickboard. If you have a tendency to really um, go towards the midline or cross midline, I would encourage you to spin that uh, kickboard, you know, so that it's now sideways. Single arm drill. So you'll see here, we've got the nice high elbow, just doing a single arm drill with the arm extended. Fingertip drag. All of these ways we're now um, actively engaging the stroke so that we can work on the propulsion. Tarzan or polo uh, often interchangeably used where the head is elevated. You keep that head nice and straight as you work towards the end of the pull. So usually you're know, doing these in 25 yard repeats is really good to do it. It'll help you what the Tarzan and polo stroke does is it really helps you to work on your um, cadence as well. And also it helps with that catch because if you drop your if you drop your elbow, you'll feel yourself pushing down and you really struggle with this. So it's a great way to work on your um, catch. Fist is another good one to get feel for the water. However, um, just be careful with it. Make sure that you're not bringing that thumb in first so that you're not having internal rotation. So when you do fist, make sure that you're almost like thinking pinky finger first as you're doing the fist. So if you are going to do it, you do like 25 or, or 12 and a half uh, with a fist and then open up and you'll be able to really feel that, that catch phase of the stroke. Um, if we look here, we can see some of the, you know, issues we've already talked about. You'll see here the swimmer crossing midline of the body uh, in their left example and in the right example, we have that fingertip entry going in first. So with both of these, these are going to slow propulsion down because the trajectory of water that's being pushed in the first example is going to go across the body, all right? And in the second example, the athlete, as they enter the water, is going to actually push the water out to the side before they push back. And we want them to be able to push that water back as quickly as, as they can. Okay, you can see here this athlete uh, not breathing um, here on the, the right-hand side. Um, so just things that, you know, when you start looking at pictures, I would encourage you to, you know, like I said, be analytical with them. Uh, we're going to move on now and just talk about the other aspect, which is that is the aspect that you're probably almost comfortable and familiar with, which is the training side of it. So we've talked about the importance of the technique side and how you can work on first and most importantly drag and then work on propulsion. So remember working on your balance. Uh, working on keeping the head nice and neutral, nice and elongated, elongated, and then working on, you know, propulsion. How does your, your body move through water? Working on some of those drills to feel that propulsion through the water. And then we, we add in the training element to it. So we're going to talk about those three um, principles of training and uh, their t intensity, duration, and frequency. So as far as swim training and application goes, um, we're going to talk about the cycle here. So the first thing is, obviously, the first thing that you want to do as an athlete is to establish your own goals and objectives. So remember that your goals that you set yourself should be measurable, something that you can measure against to say, have I made improvement? So as you're heading into the winter season to possibly work on your swim technique, start to think about what goals you want to achieve in your swimming. And you might have four or five goals. So you've got your goals and then your objectives on how you're going to achieve those goals. So we talked about how you're going to potentially achieve some of those goals and some of those objectives are to work specifically on, you know, certain swim drills, et cetera. All right. The other objectives may be that you are going to get to the pool 
five days a week for 20 minutes uh, so that you get more, more frequency in the water. So especially when we start talking about, you know, technique improvements, the more frequent you can get into the pool and for shorter periods, the better. You don't need to do long sessions, but more frequent. So for those of you that have a backyard pool, getting in for five, 10 minutes as frequently as you can and just working on one or two drills based on where you feel your biggest limiter is, is going to help you tremendously as opposed to two or three long sessions per week. So keep that in mind. Um, so we're going to talk about these aspects here, but once you've established your goals and objectives, then you want to do your own benchmarking and testing because if you can't measure it, how do you manage it? So I would start by doing some testing. You might want to do a, a CSS test, which is your critical swim speed. So a 400, 200 swim test. Um, that's going to, your critical swim speed basically being how, how fast you can swim at threshold. So you're used to doing threshold power tests, threshold run tests. CSS test, same thing. It's going to tell you at what pace roughly is your threshold. So if you if your um, CSS test works out and you can get the formula online, they have a lot of apps now that you can just plug in your 400, 200 time and it'll tell you your CSS pace. So your pace may be a 140 per 100. That's basically saying that if you were to go out and swim for 1,500 metres, you'd be able to maintain a 136 pace. So that's how that test works. <coughs> Um, you might do some 1,000 repeats to find out your endurance, um, or you might do 100. So it really depends. It goes back to what your objectives are, and um, where, if you, you know, what what type of um, events you're going to be doing as well. So if you're going to be doing short course, you might want to do some, you know, very short speed testing as well to see what your top end speed is, as well as the, um, your threshold. And maybe also your endurance, just to see how your endurance is, so that you can get that full picture of, um, of your current status. Um, you might also do some analysis through videotaping, and you may also do test your stroke rate versus time. So how many strokes does it take you to get to the end of the pool, and in what time? Um, kind of like doing the golf scores that some of you have done before, where you add stroke rate and time together to get a score. Um, so ideally, you want that stroke rate, um, the golf score to, to come down. Oops, I'll go back here if I can. All right, once you have established your testing, now you can actually work out your training zones. So if I've used CSS testing and I've worked out my, uh, my critical swim speed is a one minute 30 per 100, um, then from there I can work out my different zones of training. So my endurance zones, my tempo threshold and so on. And you'll see that, you know, basically my CSS pace when I'm working in my zone two or a tempo is going to be my CSS pace per 100. Once you've done your training zones, now you're going to start looking at your, uh, the training blocks or your phases of the training. So to break it down, if we look at our annual plan, so we have our macro cycle being our training year, and then we look at our training blocks or our meso cycles. So our meso cycles that we're looking at, and you'd probably all be very familiar with this, especially a QT2 athletes in the competition phase of training. We have, you know, your base phase of um, your base phases, you have your build phases, your peak and your race. So you're all familiar with those various meso cycles. You might be in a base period of training for anywhere between three and 18 weeks, depending on your starting point and where you've come off the season and then you might go into a build phase which might last you for you know six or eight weeks and then you go into your peak phase which may be you know three to five weeks uh, and then you go into your race all right so these are your mesocycles so you're going to determine where you are which where, uh, whether you're in your base phase or your build phase or your peak phase because the type of training you're going to do in each phase is going to different so where a lot of athletes make the mistake is that they want to improve their swim. It's early season. So what they do is in their base phase of training, they work on basically putting in lots and lots of yardage in the pool. Okay, so whereas instead of putting in lots and lots of yardage and doing lots and lots of laps, um, replicating bad technique, you're better off to do really, really short intervals, 25, 12 and a half, 25, where you're trying to get the technique that you're working towards 
doing very short spurts of it and then building on that. So it's almost like a, re a reverse periodization to what we would do for, say, running or biking. In running and biking in the base phase, we build up our, maybe our um, you know, aerobic capacity by doing lots of mileage. Whereas in the pool, we don't want to necessarily do lots of mileage early on because especially if we have these technique issues we need to work on, instead, you want to decrease the mileage, work on the technique and increase your frequency. Um, one thing that you can do is you might decide to do a swim focus block. So you might say, okay, in my base period of, of training, I'm going to actually do a swim focus block where I'm going to basically increase my um, volume by double my training. So with swimming, if you do a swim focus block and you were maybe swimming 10,000 yards a week, you can actually double that um, in swimming fairly safely. You know, in running, you can't do that um, double by doing a, a run block. You, it will lead to injury. Um, one of the things with swimming is uh, likelihood of injury is a lot lower. All right, so in your build, you may have gone through a, for example, you may have gone through a period of base training for your swim where you've just worked a lot of technique work. Now you're going into your build phase of training where you now need it to be more specific to get ready for your races. So in that build phase of your training, this is where you might decide to do a four-week swim block, for example. And in that four-week swim block, what you're going to do is you're going to do lots of swimming, maybe working on increasing your volume so that by the end of that block, you're at double what you previously were. And you're, um, you're really going to work on maybe by doing that swim block, swimming frequently, you might decrease your swim, uh, your running and biking as a result. Um, ideally, if you are going to do a swim focus block, you know, ending at about 12 to 16 weeks out from a, your A race, um, which is dependent really on distance, um, is usually what we would encourage. Um, the reason to do a swim block is that's where you're really going to see, um, you know, the gains being made, especially if you, you are one of these athletes that mainly swims you know, three times a week and you really haven't seen any really gains. Um, by doing a block, you may, it will really help to expedite those gains. It's also going to help you increase confidence and it's going to, um, you know, obviously you're going to have less stress from, you know, running and biking um, and it might help you to actually enjoy swimming because often people who don't do well at swimming don't enjoy it and it's a real, becomes a real mental stress for them. So um, a good reason to, to think about doing a swim block um, or work, talking with your coach about doing a swim block if it's one of your, if, definitely if it's one of your limiters. Um, once you've um, looked at your, you know, your training blocks or the phase of the training, now you're looking at the, your specific, how do, I, um, how do I apply this to my training? So like we talked about the principles here of time or duration, intensity and repetition, any variation of that principle, of those three principles, um, are going to lead to a totally different outcome um, and a totally different swim experience. So as you know, you can um, manipulate any one of these variables to get a very different workout. You can change up the intensity, you can change up your duration, you can change up the number of um, repetitions that you have, the amount of rest that you have between sets. So you have to think about what block of training are you in, and so remember, the blocks of training become more specific and more directed towards your race as you get closer to your race. So therefore, your swim training needs to start to replicate that. So for example, if you're doing a short course triathlon, your swim focus um, and, and this part of your season as it gets closer, it might be really working on really fast starts, moving into tempo type training. So with very little uh, rest in between it. So it really depends on the distance that you're working at as to how you're going to man manipulate those three variables. So by manipulating any of those three variables, that particular session can go from being an aerobic session through to a speed session or it can be a strength session. Remember, for a, an athlete that is maybe time limited, um, may do very well by adding uh, strength swim sessions, getting a, a good return on their investment by adding in paddles, pull buoy and so on into their training or uh, bands and they will be able to 
to get a lot of strength work done, which will give them really good return on investment. Um, and then, <clears throat> so depending on how you manipulate those variables, you're going to determine the outcome. So as far as your planning goes, you know, as we talked about this, your season program design, early in the season you want to work on your technique and those speed short repeats um, moving towards longer repeats, um, a reverse periodization approach as I mentioned, and then moving into your endurance and strength phase of your training. So usually all of you would be familiar at this point with uh, a session looking something like, you know, a warm up, a technical session and then going into your main set. As I said, you know, it's often beneficial to finish off a session with some, some of those technique uh, drills as well, just to help with muscle memory. The other thing that, you know, I, I often see as well is that we have some athletes that are really, really very good in the pool, but haven't quite been able to transfer that into open water. Um, so you need to think about what are the skills that you really need for open water. You need to be able to sight well. Drafting becomes really important in open water. You can save, as we know, up to about 30% of effort through drafting. And obviously, you need um, that swim confidence uh, for open water. So some of the challenges, and most often is that anxiety, which most of the mental challenges we face are often in extrinsically based. All right. Some of the other challenges, obviously, are you going to be your visibility and orientation, where if there are buoys, if it's surf condition, wave conditions. So for those of you that participated this past weekend in Ohio at Nationals, uh, the conditions were quite, you know, quite rough. And some athletes maybe have not used to those, have not been used to those experiences. So if you are going to, if, if you are going to participate in races, such as nationals that is held on a big body of water like a lake like Erie, you have to, you need to be prepared to be able to um, train for those conditions. If you really feel that that's not a strength of yours, then you need to make sure that you pick races where it's a very controlled body of water, maybe a smaller lake or reservoir, as opposed to a, a beach or an open water, um, a real open, big open body of water swim. Okay. The other thing is, you know, obviously wetsuits might be a challenge, especially for some folks that live down in the warmer areas of Florida and so on. They just aren't used to using wetsuits in their swim. So these are things that you need to think about when you are considering what races uh, that will help, help you to have the best swim experience possible. So some, some advice on some of the things to think about. So for open water, look at the sighting. Look at sighting to a larger object beyond your destination if possible. So if you're in a large body of water and maybe you're in a, a lake and across from where the buoy is located, there might be a big oak tree that's sitting on the opposite bank. So look when you're sizing up your race and the body of water you're swimming in, look to try and sight larger objects beyond your destination. Um, you want to obviously focus on minimal head lift while maintaining body position. So this does take practice because for those of you that haven't maybe practiced this, once you get into these longer swims, you'll find it's very fatiguing on the lower back if you don't, um, if you haven't practiced this. So these can all be practiced in the in the pool, um, and also making sure that you use that lead arm to help you sight. Remember, your lead arm is always your rudder, so use that lead arm to help you sight um, towards where your destination is. Um, you might want to try some different methods for sighting, such as crocodile eyes where you just slightly look above the water, or you might want to uh, sight as your recovery arm comes in. Practice if you can drafting. You can do this also in a pool. Um, uh, and it's really important that you also practice sighting even if you are drafting off another swimmer. A really good thing that you can do in the, in the uh, pool is doing, you know, practicing fast stunts. What I discourage often for open water swimming is a lot of athletes, especially I live in upstate New York, is they get to the time of year where we ice is off the lakes and they can actually swim in the open water and all they do is they want to go in for just these long endurance swims. Uh, you really want to take some of those, the pool technique things that you've done in the pool and apply them into the open water. 
often I'll see a decrease in speed ability once they get into open water because all they're doing is long swims. They're working on their endurance, which for the most part, most athletes have an abundance of endurance. What they lack is, is speed. So working on, even in the open water, fast start in the open water, changing up paces, using a tempo trainer. A tempo trainer sometimes is a great tool to use to help you increase cadence in the water um, for your turnover because in open water you want that higher turnover because if you have this long, lopy stroke in open water, your more um, drag will come more into play as you get tossed around with choppy water. So having that faster um, stroke will help to minimise that. So using a tempo trainer can be really valuable. It also can help to decrease anxiety. It gives you something to focus on in the open water. Um, so, you know, in the pool, um, so remember if you are uh, practicing these, go from pool into open water. Practice the fast start, the surges, and remember technique before speed. So uh, we're looking, you know, I've got some examples here of things that you can do if you're training on your own or in a group as a way to prepare yourself for open water. And finally, the last piece of this is the testing and feedback. Uh, without, te without testing, again, you're not seeing whether you've achieved those uh, goals and objectives you initially set out to do. So as I said, through manipulation of those three variables in your training continu continuum, you will start to see improvement. Um, the key is really to recognize when those adaptations are happening. So as a as you're testing and you're seeing improvement, that's when you now need to make more changes, okay? Because the body is always looking to adapt. Once it adapts and creates this state of homeostasis, you want to change it up, okay? So um, usually adapt, um, adaptation sites, um, you know, usually probably every three to four weeks you'll start to see improvements, all right? So what happens when those adaptations have occurred? You'll see your pace times obviously will improve. Um, your rest intervals will decrease and your heart rate will drop quicker after sets um, within that rest interval. Um, so the final considerations, I know we're about a couple of minutes over time here, final considerations to think about, always understand the why. Why am I doing the drill? Why am I doing this workout? How is this, how is this working towards a bigger goal? Um, swim with purpose. Uh, don't use swim as a time to relax and, um, you know, uh, you know, take it easy. Really think about the whys of what you're doing. Use that analytical approach. And I encourage you to just focus on one or two elements at a time. Remember, you've got to break things up into a small chunk. And, uh, you know, just be cautious, though, of always tightening the interval. And that's sometimes where athletes get into the trap with open, uh, with master swim. They always want to get to that next lane, uh, to that faster lane. So they're always working to a point where they're shortening intervals. Once again, you've got to go back to where you are in your training program. What block of training are you in? Because now suddenly an aerobic workout may have become totally anaerobic because now you're only getting five seconds rinse, um, interval rest between each set. So really think about, um, and sometimes you might have to swallow your pride if you are in a master swim session and say, well, what do I need to achieve at this point in time? Yep, I need to go into the slower lane because I, this needs to be my aerobic swim today. Um, you know, the other thing is I encourage you to believe in yourself, be assertive and believe in yourself and your own swim ability um, because, you know, it, it can be a vicious cycle. You end up not enjoying it, you have bad experiences and it's a downward, you know, just this downward spiral. So I really encourage you to go into this coming off season with a new, hopefully a, a new approach to how you're going to do your swimming, go in there with specific objectives and goals and test to see if you're making those improvements. And please feel free to let me know if I can be of further help or you have any questions. Um, I'm gonna end this in just a moment here. I'm just gonna see if there's anyone has a, any questions I'd like to ask. Okay, I haven't heard from anyone. So I hope you've enjoyed this session. It's given you some things to think about. Uh, we'll make sure that this particular presentation is available online to you and it will be available for future reference for you. So um, thank you for your attention tonight. I hope you've enjoyed it. Have a good evening.